This presentation is on raisins, a very popular snack item, popular around the world. Uh, I had problems with this PowerPoint file, so I just saved it as a PDF rather than fighting with PowerPoint to get it to advance the slides. If you have problems with the file, you can do the same thing. The file opened, no problem. It just wouldn't advance the slide. And I can't tell if it's my computer. I've used it on the lab computer a number of times. Something's going on, um, but it doesn't matter. The PDF will be just fine. It's a long presentation developed by somebody in India, so we can get a little international perspective. And I'm gonna blow through some of this stuff very quickly. You know, it's gonna take a while to go through 75 slides, but um, not as long as it might take if I were to stop on all of them. Um, so if you wanna see something that I blow past, just hit pause. So raisins are dried grapes, popular, popularly known as kishmish, badana, manuka, or dry fruit. Well, it's from India, right? So we have different kinds of words, but they are a sweet and healthy snack. They have high sugars, low moisture, low pH, meaning they're acidic, which makes them stable for storage in your pantry without refrigeration. And that's one of the big benefits. We kind of are, I would say, spoiled by refrigeration. And that's a very modern thing. It wasn't until the post-World War II era that refrigeration really was somewhat common in the world and people had to depend on dried meats, dried fruits, and other things to uh, survive around the calendar, to make it around the through the four seasons. You just couldn't do it any other way. Now we have refrigeration. And I think we're probably overly dependent on refrigeration in some ways, but we still have all of these other options of dried fruits and uh, raisins, a very, very healthy one. I actually have a little six pack of the tiny snack ones um, that my son bought for me last week. Uh, major production areas, don't worry about memorizing the list here, but you can see some of the production numbers um, in the comparison of 2007, eight, eight, nine. Again, you can always look up current numbers. I don't care about uh, specific data, but you can see what the trends are. Um, certainly the United States, you can see has a fairly high uh, production. Um, and there are lots of other areas that have significant production as well. Um, again, you want to look at some of the numbers, go ahead and take a peek. A uh, portion of the dry grape producer countries in the total world market, Turkey, number one, USA, number two. So you can see on the pie chart. Uh, this is one of the areas that I'm a little surprised not to see China. Uh, and I'm not sure if that is something that they chose not to include China on this list because they didn't have data for China, or if China is just because of cultural issues, they don't grow a lot of raisins or they don't turn their grapes into raisins. Um, occasionally, there are things I run across that China, just because of cultural preferences, they don't do much production, but it's rare. Uh, China is almost always at the top of the list when I look at charts like this. Um, but that's just a side note. Uh, world raisin production, again, you could look at the, at the years going up through 2015. Um, and it's been not a steady increase, but certainly the trend is an increase, clearly. Uh, gone down a couple of years, but it's been overall trend from 2005 to 15, an increase. Uh, reasons to produce it, it's certainly an important ingredient in the food industry, making breads and cakes and biscuits and other things, cookies, uh, long shelf life, less storage costs, refrigeration is 
excruciatingly expensive and really, really, really hard on the environment in terms of its carbon footprint. Refrigeration is, it's a blessing and a curse. And I think, like I said earlier, we rely on it so much and there are lots of things that we probably should rethink our food systems to have uh, certain pantry items and dried items that uh, are more gentle on the environment in general. Anyway, uh, raisins have a stable price if you're growing them, that, that's a good thing. Uh, they aren't as susceptible to fluctuations in the market like some commodities. Um, different types of raisins, you don't have to worry about the different uh, names, but you know, we have this very golden color versus what I always think of as raisins as being this dark blacker color. And I always thought that the blacker color was because we're drying red grapes and raisins were seedless reds. And that's not the case. Uh, oxidation of the sugars causes the, uh, the darkening and you have to use sulfites in order to keep it from uh, turning that black. But again, there's different kinds of grapes. The Thompson seedless, you know what that looks like. This is the, you know, I don't remember how many years ago, but I remember years ago realizing that Thompson seedless raisins are the raisin color I normally expect for my sun-made raisins. Like what? They're white grapes. Aren't they blonde raisins? And no, that's not the case. It darkens as it dries. Uh, muscat, these are actually yummy. Um, if you've ever had a chance to get muscat raisins. Uh, Zante currants. So the steps growing high quality grapes, harvest them, dry them, put them in storage for inspection, processing, and quality control, packaging, and go to the customer. Um, so how raisins are made, you first take a, uh, the grapes that, um, that ripen early, easy to dry, have a soft texture. They don't stick together when stored. Uh, no seeds, a pleasing flavor. So you're looking for a variety of grape that lends itself to making raisins. Uh, seeded grapes, most wine grapes, all wine grapes that I know of, um, not good. You don't want seeds in your raisins. And if they're sticking together, if they are difficult to dry and tend to mold before they dry properly. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So you need a variety that lends itself to the process of turning them into raisins. Um, and in India, the drying conditions, or excuse me, in India, the conditions for harvesting starts in January till May, and the grapes are harvested in bunches when obtained with optimum sweetness. They are often or they are then placed on paper trays, which are laid on the ground in between vines or rows for drying. So you can see here that they've harvested and laid them out for drying using solar energy, the sun, to dry them down. Uh, grapes are allowed to dry for about two to four weeks to reduce the moisture content below 15%. These paper trays are rolled up at night to minimize accumulation of sand and uh, protect against the raisin moth that might come in. And uh, paper trays are embedded with a compound which kills insects like the raisin moth that can damage the grapes as they dry. So there is a uh, raisin moth pesticide in the paper trays. Um, an Indian Kishmish Kana and this is something that the Indians and Australians do. They uh, dip the fresh grapes in a solution made from potassium carbonate and an Australian dipping oil, which is 400 grams of potassium carbonate in 500 mils of oil per 100 liters of water. And this reduces the drying time by half. So it's a way to speed up the dehydration 
process. And potassium carbonate, yes, it's a salt, and that's why it's helping with the drying, but it's not going to have a marked impact on flavor. So if I use sodium chloride, would that change the drying time? Absolutely. Would it make horrible tasting grapes? Absolutely. But this particular mixture can reduce the drying time um, in some situations from 30 days down to 10 to 13 days. More than half. Um, this reduction in drying time allows the Kishmish Kana to be used to produce approximately twice the amount of green raisins produced without the treatment. So you can get them through twice as fast through your, your drying system. The Indian Kishmish Kana are uh, constructed with an open wood or steel structure. And you can see a picture here, um, which allows a great deal more circulation of the air than the traditional mud brick Kishmish Kanas. For drying these racks, uh, are loaded with 10 to 15 kilograms of grapes per meter. So you can get an idea of how densely they're being packed. But this is one of the ways to do an indoor drying operation rather than doing it down through the rows on paper rolls um, laid out between the grape, uh, the grape rows. Here's the dipping process. Now this can be certainly increased in, and uh, scaled up for larger operations, but you just have the uh, dipping solution, the oil salt water mixture, and you have buckets of these grapes and dip away. And so you can see the dipping solution here, they're laying out a different way. Instead of laying them out between the rows, they're laying them out on special pads in an open uh, field or open area with a specific density. And here you can see that operation from further back next to the uh, next to the grape production vineyard, they have a vacant fallow piece of ground used for drying versus in the field drying. So pre-cleaning, there's a screen shaker that's gonna take off some of the material, uh, dust and sand, um, can go down through the screens. Light material uh, will be dispersed with a blower, so leaf material, things like that. And it's a good way to separate out the uh, raisins from the non-raisin material that ends up in the product. So this is a small operation here. You can see how it quickly separated a lot of material that ended up in that product. Plastic boxes protect the dried grape berries from compaction damage. So instead of stacking them too deeply, you're stacking them in layers of shallower containers. They're deep enough for efficiency, but not too deep to cause damage. Or some of the damage isn't, you know, it's like, how do you damage a, a grape? Well, or a raisin grape the raisins will pack together into a, a, almost a little brick at the bottom if you put too much pressure or there's too much moisture or it's just an inappropriate grape that you tried to turn into a raisin. Uh, here's an outdoor drying area. You can see the grape clusters actually hanging over these drying wires, another type of operation. And here you can see it up closer. You see these wires that are catching the weight of the grape clusters and the grapes are laid across. And here you see now it's full and they're in these uh, uh, metal uh, little Quonset hut types of structures that you can easily cover and uncover depending on the situation. So here you clearly see we have white grapes and they are no longer white. After they dry down, they naturally start to brown. Um, and you can see here at a closer view that there's still some uh, clear indication that these are white grapes, even though from a distance they look brown. Up close, you can see 
the browning process occurring faster on some of the individual grapes compared to the others. Again, the dehydration process. Uh, the golden bleach raisin. I mentioned the sulfur dioxide uh, previously. Uh, may be used at rates up to 1500 milligrams per kilogram to improve color and uh, reduce spoilage. And so you are using the sulfur dioxide to inhibit the browning. So here you see a little shovel full of the sulfur dioxide that they're using to treat or pre-treat the raisins before they uh, are dried. And so here you can see the same kind of raisins, the or the same kind of grapes, a white grape, and it starts to change color without going brown. It turns this golden amber color, and you can see that color just starting here. Uh, shade cloth, and they're continuing the drying. And I'm going to take a very quick break and be right back. <laughs> 